Then, uh, uh, next to this, letters, diaries, and other documents from individual uh, individuals who were involved in the Ethiopian in the Ethiopian War or in the Ethiopian occupation would be collected uh, and documented. All of these documents will be put uh, ultimately on the website, will be cataloged and put on the website. On the Italian side, a lot of documents have been collected. On the Ethiopian side, we have not yet uh, gone full steam ahead. We are hoping to go ahead and collect whatever documents exist, have so far existed, uh, in, the coming, uh, in the coming year. As part of this work, we plan to organize a conference in Addis Ababa uh, a year ago, but for a number of uh, <coughs> reasons we were not able to do it. And if that conference was held, Professor Ruth Bedgiat uh, and Maelda would have come to take part uh, in this, uh, in this uh, conference of memory, memory sharing, and legacies of Italian occupation. But at Abisawa, because of a number of reasons into which I would not like to go, we were not able to organize the conference. And so eventually we have it here, and we are going to, at least a part of it. The Italian colleagues are not here. The rest of us are here and reflecting on the legacies of the Italian occupation. The <coughs> Italian occupation and its legacies are a very complex. Uh, uh, they are a very complex phenomenon. And in order to put myself in this, in this. Uh, in this historical period, like Maza did and uh, like uh, Dagmar did, I'd also like to tell you a little bit about my family background. My uh, grandfather was involved in the, in the resistance war, together with his cousins and brothers and so on. Therefore, they were victims uh, uh, of the atrocities of, of the Italian. Their villages were based down. Uh, and uh, enormous uh, brutalities were committed on them. Uh, they are uh, in that part of Ethiopia, which is called the Bulga region generally. And, and so I grew up hearing the stories of the patriots and their, uh, their sacrifices and their, uh, uh, and their devotion to the country uh, and so on. And uh, and the travels through which they went, not only the, the actual combatants, but also their families and their relatives, the members <coughs> of their area. Uh, most of them paid heavy price for the involvement uh, in, the, in the resistance of the patriots. Uh, it was a surprise to me when I went to college to learn uh, in my history classes that the, the resistance movement was indeed a strong movement, but then there was also widespread collaboration. When I grew up in the family, in high school education, and so on, the image, the impression that I had was, it was pretty much, you know, uh, resistance by the people around the country, there were indeed collaborators, members of my family, my grand aunts, my grand uncles, everybody talked of, you know, Mr. X was bad, Mr. Y was terrible, and so on, who allied up with the Italians, led the Italians to, to this place to kill, uh, to kill one of our relatives, and so on. So there were bad collaborators, but we never knew that entire communities collaborated with Italians. Entire religious communities, entire ethnic groups uh, collaborated with the Italians, and that <coughs> collaboration was indeed very <coughs> extensive. The patriotic movement was very active, was very strong, was very powerful in a number of provinces, particularly in the province of Shao, which uh, was a very vast province, uh, which extends from the Gili River all the way to to the northern tip, but near Wernero. And so a number of, uh, if we talk in terms of uh, uh, ethnic groups, 
the Oromov Shah, the Bragyov Shah, and the Amharov Shah fought very, very bravely and fiercely against the Italians. Uh, the whole region of Kojang was up in arms. The whole region of Bagimdur was up in arms. Uh, but then a number of other provinces were very peaceful and collaborated with the Italians. Western Romia, as we call it now, southern Ethiopia, the region of Arsi, Harar, um, the Afar lowlands, the uh, organic lowlands, uh, uh, in the north, Tigray, uh, were all peaceful areas, and as far as the Italians were concerned. So this was a revelation after I grew up. But when, uh, when we were boys, we all felt that you know the entire Ethiopian region was up and fighting. Then we come to the folk stories uh, that again uh, give you a, a different perspective to the Italian people, to the history. Folk histories that come, the folk stories that come from the resistance areas and the folk stories that come from the areas that accepted Italian rule as, as a group, as a community and so on. The folk stories that come from the, from the resistance areas always uh, highlighted the bravery, the heroism, the, de the dedication of the patriots. But at the same time, they pointed out the, the demands of the patriots on the people for food and other support. The ordinary people were not always willing to be seen as helping the patriots because the Italians would come after them later. But the patriots would come in the night and demand very many things. And if they refused, the punishment would be very severe uh, from the local people, on the local people. So this is a different story. In the, in the areas where there was large-scale collaboration, where the chiefs and the local people participated, and where there was no meaningful resistance at all, like in Hara, Ars in southern Ethiopia, and western Ethiopia, in Afarland and in Buragiland, the memory and the folk stories are generally very positive for the, Ethiop uh, for the Italians uh, the, the ruling the country. The next uh, interesting aspect that we have to see is, was this war a colonial war? Mussolini and the fascist state wanted us to believe that it was a colonial war. Uh, unfortunately, very many historians have taken this up and have put the Ethiopian war within the framework of the African colonial war. Uh, in actual fact, it was not a colonial war, of the, like the wars of the late 19th century. This was a war that preceded the Second World War, and it could be seen as part of that great global explosion of the Second World War. So this should be seen as part of, like the war in China, where the Japanese invaded China, and so on, uh, like the war uh, uh, in Europe, and so on. It only preceded the Second World War, and we like to see it as a precedent, as a precedent to the Second World War. Many reasons for this, uh, and I do not want to go into this. Uh, only mention a number of facts that that would uh, that would uh, that would help us understand the situation. There was an international institution at the time, the League of Nations, which uh, made it illegal to invade member countries. This kind of international uh, institution did not exist at the end of the 19th century. And in fact, the international law of European countries at the end of the 19th century made it legal to conquer African countries. Whereas here, you have this international institution, the League of Nations, which clearly uh, made it illegal. And Ethiopia was a member of this League of Nations as well as Italy. So it was an illegal war by the international law of the time. A, B, it was a war of one state against another recognized state by the international community. Ethiopia was a state 
recognized by the international community in different ways. Whereas in African countries, the African polities and communities that were uh, invaded by the European powers were not recognized by European powers, had not been recognized by European powers before. An interesting aspect of this war was the fact that like in France, like in China, like uh, in Poland, and so on, one form of nationalism uh, confronted another nationalism, clearly defined nationalism, uh, like, uh, unlike the end of the 19th century, when there was no articulated nationalism on the part of African communities, politics, and so on. The Ethiopian state had a very vibrant, a very strong nationalism that was in the process of being modernized in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, this nationalism had a very, very long history uh, in Ethiopia, and we know very well from the documents that were published in the 13th century, in the 14th, 15th, and so on centuries, that Ethiopians had indeed uh, a well-articulated form of nationalism, and now recently, the students of nationalism globally have recognized this Ethiopian nationalism uh, before modern times. Up until recently, it was believed by social scientists that nationalism was a phenomenon of the capitalist era. Now we know that it was not a phenomenon of the capitalist era only, it was a phenomenon that preceded very, very much the capitalist era. And one of the examples is Ethiopia, where nationalism was strongly articulated. This nationalism was, of course, articulated in religious terms. But that doesn't make it any less nationalist than the other nationalism of the capitalist era that is uh, articulated in secular terms. Now, as we come into the 20th century, under the rule of Tafari Makonan and later Haile Selassie, there were serious attempts to, uh, to uh, modernize this, uh, this nationalism to make it inclusive. It was previously exclusive because the Ethiopian nation was a nation of Ethiopian Orthodox Christians. And they did not really, as uh, subjects, did not include the Muslims. And so it was indeed uh, had to be modified to make it uh, inclusive. It has to be put uh, in modern terms, in modern language. And so when the Italians invaded Ethiopia, it was one nationalism that was coming to invade it. And a nationalism that was uh, putting up. And the warriors on this side were fighting clearly in nationalist terms. Uh, we have plenty of evidence for that. We, are, we should not talk as historians without evidence. And we have evidence that these people were fighting because they wanted their sovereignty to continue, their national, uh, 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 their national independence to be maintained their freedom to be recognized. They did not want to be ruled by an alien state. So this makes it also uh, really a part of Second World War ra rather than a part of the colonial war of the 19th century. Like the Polish, the, like the Poles who fought to maintain their sovereignty, their independence, their freedom, their national identity, if you like, and so on and so forth, like the French and so on, like the Chinese who also articulated there, there. And so we have this war, which was not a, col a colonial war, uh, which was rather a uh, uh, one of the wars that preceded the Second World War, the Second World War and that led up to the Second World War, together with the Chinese and the Spanish and so on. Uh, the war was fought. There was uh, a very fierce resistance as I pointed out, as was pointed out earlier on, and there was widespread collaboration. The resistance captured the attention of the world at the time. Europeans were taken by surprise, including Italians, because the resistance was indeed inspired by nationalist feelings. And given the, 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 the attitude, the prevalent attitude at the time, how could black people have a sense of an abstract, the abstract notion of a state? of an identity with a state, with Ethiopia, and a refusal to accept uh, a rule by a foreign, an alien power. They could not believe it, but it was there and it was quite uh, strong, you know. And uh, 
globally recognized guerrilla leaders at the time, like Mao Zedong, mm -hmm. took this up and made comments on the mode of fighting, etc. The collaboration was not given that kind of recognition worldwide. The Italians wanted very hard the world uh, so that the world would see that there were collaborators. Leaders were invited to Rome, and big parties were organized and offered for them. Abba Jovir of Jijima, the Sultan Dinle of Somalia, uh, uh, the leader of the Birgania Order from Eritrea, the Archbishop of the Ethiopian Church, Rasailu of Koja, all of them were invited to Rome, where they were received in the Palace of Venezia, the Palace of Mussolini, uh, and the press was invited, and they, uh, parades were, military parades were organized for them in the Piazza Venezia to show the world that indeed Mussolini was accepted by the people who mattered, by the important people of the country. But that did not go down well with the rest of the world. What really was, uh, what, what really hit the world in Africa, in Europe, in the black world of the, of the West, uh, of the West, like the West Indies and so on, was the resistance. Then the Second World War, indeed, it built up into the Second World War, and then Ethiopia was liberated. I don't want to go into all that. Now, after Ethiopia was liberated, the government, the Ethiopian government, decided, of course, to build up the new Ethiopia, the new nationalism, uh, partly on this war and so on. The war was made, the resistance was made, the defining movement of modern Ethiopia. It was presented as a shared history of all Ethiopian people. The, the media was mobilized, the church was mobilized, to the extent that it was possible. Islamic establishments were also organized. Ethiopia had a uh, history and had the bad other, and the bad other are now the Italians. In the past, it was the Egyptians. Further way back, it was the Turks, the Ottoman Turks. All of these were lined up, and and they said, you know, uh, we should continue to build up as one people. In this process, deliberate amnesia was introduced, an attempt to forget, to overlook our entire history, the history of the collaboration. We don't know why they decided that, because all the archives are not yet open for us. Perhaps they did it because they thought it would not help the process of nation building, the process of consolidating Ethiopian nationalism. Perhaps they thought that way, but the large scale collaboration, the issues that, was, that were raised during the process of collaboration were not, uh, were not uh, highlighted, were not given sufficient space. Some of the issues that were highlighted, you know, ethnic domination, religious domination, some of the chiefs of Oromia, of the West, Western Oromia, like Wollega and Demidolo and Jimma, clearly arti articulated in letters that they wrote to Graziani and to others that the Oromo were oppressed by the Amhara and that, therefore, the Italians were better than the Amharas who were ruling the country. This was articulated. The Afar had articulated their own grievances in these terms, Southern Ethiopian peoples, and so on. The Raya of the North, in a similar fashion, had articulated it, even if we do not have uh, written evidence from them, like we have from the chiefs of Western Europe. It's only secondhand from Italian officials that we had their, their views. Now, this view that these political issues that were raised by the by these different chiefs who opted to collaborate uh, were overlooked and were not given were not highlighted in the post in the post-41 political dispensation. Only the patriotic movement was, was, was put forward, and it was also presented as an activity of all the Ethiopian, <coughs> of all the Ethiopian people. No distinction was made. Uh, the intellectual elite of the country 
uh, 1940s, 50s, and so on, shared this view. It was a shared opinion. It was not only a government opinion, it was a shared opinion. As I told you before, my people did not tell me that there was large scale collaboration. They should have known, and they knew. Uh, very many people I asked later on uh, told, told, told me that no, the, their parents did not tell them what they did not tell them what the situation, the complication, the complexity of the situation in the Italian. So it was a government view. It was also a shared view that existed. Now, it is this view that now comes being presented in the literature, in the novels, in the poetry, in the plays that were produced in very impressive numbers uh, in the country. Of the plays and novels, the biggest production, artistic production, was in poetry. Partly because poetry was uh, a very old genre, very well known for the Ethiopians, and so very many people easily went into it, produced poems. Uh, novels were new things, as Atoilma Yadresa, uh, whom I'm going to mention, would say. Uh, and so that it was coming forward, uh, it was Afor and Hulu who started it. It will take time for, uh, for the novel to spread and to, be, uh, to become a sophisticated genre in American literature. The first literary work appeared actually a few, uh, a f very shortly after independence, after the independence of the country was declared. It was a book that was uh, edited by Yilma Dresa. Uh, the title is The Adizamantarik, Selenus Annet Kum. It is a collection of poems. There is only one little prose piece in addition to the introduction that was written by Aurelia. There are 74 authors in this book and 75 poems because two of the authors do uh, poems twice. Uh, and one prose a piece, as I said, uh, written by Ato Pranudin. Interestingly enough, uh, a woman, women authors are also mentioned. Uh, and here we have three women who come out and uh, contribute uh, poems. One of the women, however, died very soon after that. She did not even finish her uh, poem. She was a young woman of 20. She was very patriotic, very nationalistic. But she died very soon after the liberation. Yilma Dresa writes a very interesting introduction in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, to this book. He emerges as one of the top politicians of the country. Uh, uh, he is one of those who becomes a public figure afterwards. There are others who also become uh, Kabbalah and Mikhail was one of the contributors, and Kabbalah Mikhail becomes also a national literary figure. But as we know, Kabbalah Mikhail never took up the, the theme of the, the resistance, the struggle uh, for a major work. The third uh, person who also becomes an important person was Brahman uh, Linke. Irma Dereza originates in Western Ethiopia. He belongs to, the chiefly, to one of the chiefly families, leading families of rural And in 1936, um, taking you back now, when Graziani Inter was in Addis Ababa, he sent a letter to the chiefs of Western Ethiopia asking them to submit peacefully. Uh, on the ground that he had come to throw out the Amhara, the bad Amhara rule, as he put it, and that the Oromo or oppressed should now uh, get their, their place. And so the the families of Yerma did indeed write back to, uh, to Graziani, accepting Italian rule and so on. Yerma at the time was the famous patriotic group called the Black Lions, who were preparing to fight an extended war, a protracted war. But that did not succeed, and uh, they were defeated uh, a few months later, and they were captured. But in the process, Yilma also uh, worked together with his relatives in the approach that his relatives made to the British, asking the British to take them over as, as a protectorate territory rather than the Italians. 
So Yilma was involved in these uh, delicate negotiations. So Yilma knew the situation. And in this introduction, Yilma uh, tells us that the Italians really hurt the country by dividing us along ethnic lines. By putting the Oromo against the Amara, the Amara against another one, and so forth. So a clear statement about the serious divisions that existed and the advantage the, the Italians took of this situation. After, in the works that come later, uh, this kind of uh, statement does not appear. And even Yilma's uh, statement was a guarded statement. His full knowledge of the situation uh, does not come out in this little introduction. And now, the literary works to keep people's memory alive. Then there are other institutions that kept the memory of the Italian occupation with a highlight on the resistance alive. One was the public holidays, Meazi Hasabat, April, uh, May 5, and Yekati 12, uh, April 9, were uh, celebrated, parades were organized, and these parades uh, and other activities in which the rulers were involved, the top people were involved, were given very high uh, place in the national mass media, and that was done every year, and that kept the memory alive. Monuments. The first monument that was built up was for uh, this holy man, Abuna, Abuna, Abuna Etros. The second monument was for, Yekat, uh, for the massacre of Graziani. The third monument was for the liberation day. And it was in the middle of the town. It was there to remind people. These are places of memory. As the French historians would like to say, lié de mémoire. Ancestion de mémoire. Then there were the churches. For instance, in the United States, the Trinity Cathedral was the biggest, most impressive royal church. The church of Emperor Alexander, where the royal family, including the emperor himself, were meant to be buried. And this church was exclusively uh, put aside for the burial of patriots and people who went abroad, who were exiled. No other Ethiopian would be buried in that, on the grounds of that church except patriots, the imperial family, the heads of the church, the patriarch and bishops. And so Every time a member of the of the, of, of the royal family died, or the uh, or of the uh, patriots died, that place was there, and it got into the So the Trinity Cathedral was there as an important near the memoir. The Madonna Church of Sebastian was again another near the memoir. Finally, I come to, I come to the educational church, the army, and the police, who are used as institutions to pass on this message. Now, I have only five minutes, and I will conclude <laughs> <laughs> my We have to allow, uh, I, I go to the, to the will and wishes of, the, of Madam Chair. <laughs> we can have three stages in the production of literary works uh, regarding this theme. The first was the imperial period, from 1941 to 1974. The second was the third period from 1974 to 1991. The third is this period, 1991, to the present. In the imperial period, uh, several novels were written, uh, plays were presented, and poems in very, very large number were published, were laid out on, uh, on the radio, were recited on various public. They were the biggest instrument. Poetry was the biggest instrument. The novels, literary works of the imperial period shared a number of characteristics. They were highly patriotic. The independence, freedom for the country. The antiquity of Ethiopia was always presented. Uh, glorious events from the past were brought out as a background to this event, which was again another glorious event. 
That is to say, you know, the war against the Turks, etc., was a distant background. The immediate background was the Battle of Adwa and its glories. And then the resistance was presented as another glorious, uh, glorious, glorious event. And the eventual liberation of the country, which was attributed to the Ethiopian arms, uh, to the leadership of the Emperor, and with some help from the British. Not much. Uh, recognition was given to British. Emperor Haile was highlighted as an iconic figure, as a central figure, and indeed many of these, as uh, my uh, previous speakers highlighted, believed in the greatness of the emperor from the first book in 1941 right up to the last book uh, in, the, in the late 1960s. Then we go to the uh, to the military period where there is a shift in perspective. The role of Haile Selassie was changed, was reduced, was taken out, and he was actually condemned, in many of the words, for his move. He went to, after the war, he went to England, where he stayed, and so on. This was presented as flight, as cowardice, as betrayal of the country, and then Against that background, the patriots were lauded, were, uh, were presented as iconic figures. <coughs> Emperor Haile killed uh, one of the patriot leaders, Balazemleka, and that was also uh, put at his, at his door. He was blamed for it. He did not give sufficient recognition to the patriots afterwards, etc., etc. Apart from that, the patriots' nationalism the long background and the immediate background were the same. The current period. The current period is very interesting because different voices came up. One of the most interesting voices that aroused intense controversy in the early years of this government was the article written by Tespe Habiso, a politician who comes from Kambata, who was in the in the in the uh, in the provisional parliament at that time, he wrote that, look, you know, for, uh, for us, the people of Kambata, the Italian period was a good period. In fact, it was better than the rule of the left age. He published this in Addisem, and then uh, all outcry, people saying, how can you say this, etc. Or other politicians made uh, statements or articles, uh, also casting uh, doubt uh, and casting, you know, Aspersions on this uh, uh, on the patriotic period. Uh, uh, other politicians from the TPLF and so on went out and also in a similar fashion cast aspersions in this period. So there is this aspect. But then the old theme and the old line, the old line continued. People stood up and said, no, 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 the patriotic movement was a great movement, just like the Adwa. The 1895-96 war was a great, a great war. Uh, the government finally seems to have conceded this much. Uh, in its presentation of history, it went out and tried to destroy whatever good images Menelik had. And so there is a continuous campaign against Menelik for the last 23 years, and we believe it will continue. But the Battle of Adwa is still a national, uh, a national, a national effort, a national glory. So, in the textbooks which was mentioned this morning earlier on, the 19th century is given, and Milenik and his army and his state are painted in the darkest colors you can imagine. Uh, the exception comes when you go to this war of 1895, 96 against the Italians. Even then, Milenik is not given the credit. It is the people of Ethiopia who won the war, but at least uh, otherwise is there. The Haile Selassie is, is also presented in the, in the darkest terms. Uh, he is very much, uh, I have one minute, now I can. Haile Selassie is presented in the darkest terms. He, uh, he is not given any credit, but the patriotic movement is still recognized as an important event in national history. And these two have gone into our text as positive events, whereas the reins of Haile Selassie, the military, have gone into the history books as dark periods. 
How about the literature? Does the new literature reflect this? Uh, the, the answer is diary. Some works do that, some don't. It's, it's, no, it's no more a linear, uh, a linear uh, process, a linear evolution. Now it's a more complex, a more diversified uh, approach to Ethiopia's modern history. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And uh, I, I select her here to talk about her here because uh, she has a very rich story about her encounters with Italians, uh, with the Italian uh, invaders at the time. Uh, her first experience witnessing Italians uh, was when she arrived at, uh, at the age of 13 uh, as the wife of uh, the Jazmaj Nasibu Zamanwe, who was then uh, the Ethiopian Council in Italian held uh, Asmara. And uh, here again, you know, in her telling of the story, she goes into a lot of detail about the jewelry, you know, the marriage, the, the actual the, uh, the uh, ceremony that took place, the jewelry that the, she would wear. Uh, she misses the train to Asmara. Uh, and so she misses, she misses, you know, seeing her husband the way it was planned. But then she uh, meets with him later on and, uh, and uh, moves to Asmara and uh, views Italians there for the first time. Um, and, and then she gives a very candid account of, you know, she went on and left him, came back. She was the emperor's uh, third cousin, so quite close to the palace, was raised with uh, uh, Lil Tanayok, was close friends with Lil Tanayok. And so she was a, a woman of, you know, of, that people would seek to marry if you were to uh, uh, forge a relationship with the emperor. She was uh, one of the women who would be in demand for that. Um, Eventually, her third marriage is to a young sergeant at the time. He was in the Kabir Zabinya, uh, 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 who she doesn't want to make the direct connection, but he gets promoted to Balambaras soon after he marries her. So, you know, kind of to keep status there. Uh, and then a couple of, of years later, the Italian invasion happens. And I'll share with you sort of a stream of images that come out of the conversation I, I had with her then. Um, but but uh, it, it's the detail in which she recounts it, which is really important, and which I think gets lost once you move away from these individual stories and start creating a, a grander narrative of history. A lot of this gets lost. Um, and so she tells the story. She escaped from Addis Ababa on a Monday. Uh, the Italians would come into the city on Tuesday. And she ex escapes on a horse, and she has a mule. And these were provided to her by a, an Armenian neighbor who uh, was going to help her to, to uh, leave. And she describes the looting. The roads were closed. Uh, she uh, encounters the encounter groups. There's uh, um, a group of 12 men and six women. I have to get my figures right. But um, she, uh, and she has six, uh, her husband has, uh, she has six Maria Teresa dollars, and her husband silver coins, and her husband Ras Ababa only had two Maria Teresa uh, uh, coins. And uh, she has uh, a, a child, a baby, who's 10 months old as she's leaving. So the baby is, is leaving with them. And um, as they get, they get uh, away from Addis Ababa, to uh, Gimbichu, uh, where uh, uh, Ras Barakai's uh, uh, grandfather has land there, Ras Kobana had land there. And they're joined there with a group that comes from Desi, about 300 person group. And um, this group, uh, some of the soldiers had dysentery. And, uh, and the baby catches uh, this disease and dies, the 10 month baby dies. So after that, Mama Konjut goes into a cave. She goes into hiding in a cave. And she has no change of clothes. She's in the company of other women. They begin to maftal, to weave a, a net ala. And that net ala becomes very important for the second child that she has to be able to keep him warm. Um, and um, uh, earlier, Ras Baba's mother had asked her to come to where she lived, where the Italians had not reached yet. And she had refused to stay in the city. So now she was kind of subject to doing the escape with, with the group. Uh, and so she's, she's in this situation. Um, she has a child, another child, uh, and is captured three months after that. And she talks about you know, the daily life. There was no food. There was no milk for the, for the child. Um, uh, her husband was a very, of course, prominent patriot. And he was uh, trying to coordinate uh, resistance fighting with other patriots at the time, so he wasn't with her the whole time. And occasionally, he would, he would, uh, she had no change of clothes. She, he would try to uh, send her uh, clothes and, and uh, uh, you know, trousers to wear under the dress and some tape. And as it so happened, this one day, he was, you know, 
Jim on this on the on the donkey to send to to uh, Mama Kojit and the donkey kind of took off with everything. So she never saw any of the you know at a time when it's extremely you know needed uh, the donkey took off. So she never got to see uh, any of this. Eventually she uh, gets captured um, and uh, she gets captured because one of the men that they send ahead uh, of the group to look for food. Um, is stopped by uh, uh, pro-Italian for uh, soldiers, uh, Ethiopian soldiers, and they ask him what he's doing, and he says, uh, "Oh, you know, I'm going to go and and, and get food." And they say, uh, uh, "Is it true? Unat uh, like estiman nimut, like swear on the name of someone?" And he says, "Abba beimut." Right away, instinctively, he, he swears by the name of Rasa Abba. And so it's immediately known that uh, uh, he is a part of Rasa Abba's group, and he's asked to lead them back to uh, Mama Konjit, and, and uh, Rasa Abba's not there with them, but he leads them back to the group, and they go into, into, uh, into uh, they, she becomes imprisoned. She becomes imprisoned, and she, she stays in prison for about two and a half uh, years on and off. And uh, it, it doesn't all happen at one go in one interview, but over time you also begin to realize how she was outsmarting the Italians uh, in the negotiation to capture the husband. Of course, they wanted to use her as, as the negotiating piece. And she would claim ignorance at every turn. She would say, oh, I don't know, you know, I don't write, I, I don't read, I don't. And, and she would uh, thwart them at every turn uh, when they were trying to use her to, to uh, lure uh, Rasa Pave into, into the, um, uh, to capture him, basically, to, to lure him in. Um, what becomes very obvious, I mean, probably after all of this, in my work, in my uh, uh, research, research, dissertation when I wrote it, what survived of this is probably, and also because it wasn't Italian-focused necessarily, uh, is probably that Wizaro Konjut married these three gentlemen, and maybe something about the marriages, if she remembers them. That's what ended up in the dissertation. So there's this very rich storytelling that's happening on this end, and then I feel compelled to, you know, I cannot include all of this. So what happens? What happens to those stories in between is the thing that I still haven't found the answer to it. But it's a, it's a, it's um, a, a chain that gets broken, and I'm not sure who's responsible. Is it the, is it the work of artists? Is it the work of, uh, is it people who should write memoirs to capture these stories in their nuances? Uh, where do the stories go? Is it in the archives and the institutions that uh, we set up? So that's a question that keeps uh, recurring in, in my own um, thinking. Uh, I know for, uh, we'll be seeing Haile Garima's work later, uh, Adwa, the filmmaker Haile Garima's work, Adwa later. But he, as well as Yamana, Yamana Jugozo, professor of film here, are two people that have worked extensively in um, documenting uh, stories, uh, documenting history as people perceive themselves and straight from, from people, primary, primary documents, I, I would say, um, of, of the Adwa generation. Of the, of the, and um, Haile's film, the next film will be called The Children of Adwa. And um, I was able to, before I came, also uh, sit and watch some of the footage that he'd collected over the years. Uh, and there was one very uh, powerful story that I'll share with you here, another you know, sort of uh, detailed, nuanced story um, that really kind of captures the moment, the interactive moments between Italians and Ethiopians in a, in a, in a unique way, I think. Um, the story is told by a man named Haile, and uh, he is speaking about his grandfather's uh, story, Fitaurari Amanu Haile. Uh, Fitarari Amenu Hailu is had fought in the Battle of Adwa and in the uh, uh, in the second round in 1935, uh, he was too old to fight, and so he had stayed home. He was reputed to be over 100 years old at that time. And uh, immediately after the Graziani massacre, the uh, the person who replaced. Uh, 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 as deputy governor, who replaced uh, Enrico Cerulli at the time, was the deputy viceroy, uh, was a general named uh, Guglielmo Nasi. And uh, Nasi gets word that uh, this man is alive. This man that had fought at, at Adwa uh, was alive, and he doesn't believe it. He wants to go and visit. And so uh, Nasi, Na Nasi goes to visit Fitarari Amanu. 
uh, with uh, uh, Latin Geta Unida Mascal is also with him accompanying him. And it takes a while to get there. They take the train, they take uh, the mule, and they arrive there. And this is how the conversation goes, as told by the grandson. Uh, so, Kitarere Amanu says, yeah, oh, well, Damascal, how are you? You know, uh, what brings you here today? Uh, um, and well, Damascal says, oh, you're surprised by my visit. Oh, I also have General Nasi with me, and, and he really wants to hear your story about Adwa. And then Nasi takes up, Nasi takes up the conversation and says, uh, you know, aren't you pleased we came to visit you? And, and did you fight in Adwa? And what were the circumstances? And he asks some, some, some details, and Amaru provides extreme details. We fought here, we got captured here, this is what happened there. And Nasi, from his knowledge of Adwa, corroborates the, the story. Um, so eventually Nasi comes around to say, to asking him, what happened to you guys this time around? How come we were able to just walk into the country and take over? Uh, if there was all this, you know, heroism and courage in the past, what happened this time around? And uh, Fitarari Amanu says something very powerful. I'll say it in Amharic first. And he says, uh, So, you came when we had all retired, basically, after we had all begun staying at home. It's the timing of the thing that, that made this happen. So, of course, Nasi picks up on this and he says, Oh, you know, are you saying that the people now, they don't, they don't have the courage? Or what is it, you know, that, that uh, people are lacking now? Um, and Amaru kind of plays off of that and says, well, if it wasn't the case, then how else would you guys have been able to walk in? Uh, so it's a very interesting back and forth that happens with two of them. And of course, Nasi is, is struck by the, you know, the, the, the very sort of self-assured way that uh, Fitar Ariyaman is responding. And immediately he says, oh, this guy, he's not Ethiopian. Look at him, he's very light-skinned. He must have more semantic blood. Um, and, and he tries to bring him around. And he says, you know, why do you say, stay so far from the city anyway? Why do you, uh, you know, live in this inconvenience? There's nothing here. You're outside of it, all the resources. And the man responds, a man responds, and he says, this is my earth. He doesn't say land. He says, this is my earth. And uh, I've been here for 30 years. I'm not going anywhere. So uh, Nasi says, well, everything that you've told me is the truth. And uh, I, wish you, I, I, you know, I would like to take you to Addis Ababa. If you refuse, I will uh, set up a salary for you. And you will get a payment uh, every month. And the man doesn't respond. Amanu doesn't respond. They leave. Uh, and as soon as they leave, he, Amanu calls the people who are uh, living on his land, the families that are uh, living around him. And he says, if you touch a penny of what this man gives you, if you put it towards my food or my upkeep in any way, I will curse you uh, in the name of Theodros. And Theodros was the farmland that he had in one area that he had named after the emperor's name. And he says, may Theodros be a, a bane in your life, like may it be a thorn so that you don't have any produce from the land anymore. And he curses them, and, and that's where it ends. So I, I, um, the thing that I realize in, in my efforts trying to read and write history is a lot of these tangential stories that seem tangential, stories that seem like meandering kind of you know, explorations in the telling. You, know, you want to get at, to, at a subject, and you're trying to push them to stay focused on a subject. But there's a very rich storytelling tradition in poetry, in song, people would stop in the middle of the interview and begin a, a, a poem or sing a song. And who am I to write a history that doesn't have that? I mean, that's, that becomes the dilemma, I guess, in the end. Um, I'll end with a very brief um, uh, last story that kind of has me circling back to Gar Sagai. Sagai Gabramatin, when he wrote, it was at that hour, time, yeah? Two minutes. Okay. I think I don't know how many of you understand Amharic, but the way that Garsagay writes that play is very interesting. It happens because of an incident at the monument of Petros. Uh, Garsagay is coming out of a meeting and he sees someone, a drunken man, peeing on Petros' statue. And he gets out of his car, gets into a physical fight with the guy gets very upset and goes home and writes Petros Yachinsat, Petros at that hour, in one night, almost as, a, as a, you know, an angry kind of response to 
you know, and the man is talking to the statue as he, he's peeing, and he's saying, who are you anyway? What relevance do you have, you know, here and now? And, and some guy is saying, what, Petros is of course relevant. So it's a two or three minute audio, and I'd like you to hear it in Garzagai's words, maybe, and I'll stop there. Yeah. We have Excuse me. Can it come out on the mic? No. No? Sorry. You are stone. And there's a guy jumps out of the car and he says, he's not stone. But, but, and, and the man is saying to Petros, look, when all your peers have very comfortable lives now, 
you have remained stone. What, what has happened for you? And uh, Garzagai, to counter that, goes off and writes this play. So, so much for the power. <laughs> I'll try to be uh, brief. Uh, there are a lot of overlaps, uh, and let me begin, uh, and I'll maybe underline some of the things that um, Professor Shafarov uh, 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 pointed out in his incisive presentation. I wanted maybe initially to talk about the question of archives and by way of ending uh, the imperatives of literature uh, and, and, and talk about uh, uh, translation work uh, that I'm doing. Uh, I recently mm -hmm. finished a translation of Sabahat, uh, Governor Xavier's uh, The Seventh Angel, Sabah Teng Omelak. So maybe I'll uh, end on uh, the imperative of literature uh, by, uh, by way of translation, the question of translation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I was thinking in terms of what to say in this presentation. And if I were trying to go back and do a cultural or a literary history of uh, the Italian occupation uh, and some of the questions that may come up and how to avoid certain uh, pitfalls. And as I said, uh, I'll touch on some of the points that uh, Professor Schaffer, uh, uh pointed out. Um, the question is, I think, uh, and we saw this in the presentations yesterday, how they were able to stitch together uh, different archives to come up with this incredible portrait and fabric uh, that represents, that has texture of uh, Tamarat Emanuel. Right? So I think anyone who's interested in, in, in uh, uh, doing substantive work on this period, it, it requires consulting a number of archives in order for us to have a very textured, uh, complicated uh, picture. Um, now, in my estimation, and this may be as an outside observer, uh, who's not a specialist in this period, uh, there's, there's certain lacunas or gaps in the archive. And, um, following up one, on the point that Professor Shaparwa mentioned, the question of collaboration and resistance, and I mentioned this earlier uh, in the panel, uh, one has to, I think, confront uh, an Ethiopia, a deeply Ethiopian temperament uh, and sensibility of pride when we have a history that goes against that temperament, how do we begin to uh, uh, confront that legacy, right? Because again, the occupation would entail talking about collaboration and also talking about occupation that goes counter to this, you know, millennia old history of independence and self-determination, right? So someone writing that story would have to face the kind of underside sensibilities uh, that I think uh, that's not in keeping with an Ethiopian temperament, uh, especially a pride, right? Um, now, the other is in terms of uh, in the popular imagination, in the Ethiopian popular imaginary, why is uh, this period uh, a kind of, maybe not a footnote, but doesn't have the same uh, importance? Um, um, one may be, I think, how professional history has worked in Ethiopia, where the emphasis for so long was on a kind of positivist history. And I think, uh, and, and Professor, you may correct me on this, but it's only now that the, the professoriate, the, the professional historians are taking up the history from below, right? The people's history, uh, so that oral narratives have as much purchase uh, uh, you know, stories of everyday people are now having to have currency, whereas Ethiopian history, for the most part, has been top down. It's the patriots, it's the generals, it's the fitauraris, it's the so on and so forth, right? And that has a way of, I think, eclipsing the story of everyday ordinary people. And again, here we have to talk about another Ethiopian temperament: our attack, our obsession with status, right, uh, and with rank. Uh, um, and this would mean taking uh, seriously the story of people who are on the very margins, who don't have rank, who don't have status, but whose stories are just as important in terms of thinking about uh, uh, the Italian occupation, right? Um, 
So uh, the archive, in terms of when we go to the archive, we have to be attuned to recover the stories that wouldn't necessarily court uh, attention in the public sphere. Also, there are um, uh, publications that have disappeared. I was uh, 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 fascinated by a publication called Amdabarahan's um, Ethiopia, loosely translated as Pillar of Life in Ethiopia, uh, which was a publication which had seven uh, issues, and it was uh, published during the occupation. And this was a collaboration between an Armenian uh, and a group of Ethiopians, and this is where they're uh, and, you know, published uh, on the low, if you will, a very clandestine activity. And this is where they're actually um, uh, here, uh, you know, there's censorship on the radio in terms of what Ethiopians could hear on the radio during the occupation. And they would hear stories on the BBC and translate them, transcribe them, and uh, uh, disseminate this information to patriots, right? Now, it turns out no, uh, the, no, there's no record of this publication in, in, in the archive. But there are people who commented on the existence of the publication, some say seven, some say eight uh, um, uh, issues. Um, uh, so there are also uh, archives that have disappeared, and we have to try to salvage them uh, uh, somehow. And again, I was taken by the presentations yesterday uh, of the way in which they were able to salvage a letter here, uh, an art, you know, a source here, uh, and piece together uh, this story. Um, now, the um, the other would be um, again the question of uh, the literary narrative. I mean, for a, a, a civilization that's had uh, a writing and literature for millennia, the the secular literature in Amharic is a very recent enterprise. It's really a 20th century undertaking, right? And the novel itself is a, a, a recent enterprise. And um, I want to call up his spirit, the late uh, Jonas Admasu, one of the great uh, literary critics in Amharic. He has an essay called, uh, What Were They Writing About Anyway? Tradition and Modernization in Ethiopian Literature, where he gives us a literary history of uh, uh, the novel and secular writing in Amharic. And uh, he charts it out in a similar way uh, that Professor Shifara said, uh, 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 did, but he points out that actually the, the great Amharic writers that we, we love and we prize, and the texts that we prize, he says that these are actually texts that came in the 50s, but moreover after the failed coup d'etat of the 1960. So there's a huge concentration of the great Amharic literature being produced uh, uh, under imperial, uh, under the, the emperor's reign, but specifically after the failed coup d'etat, uh, and also that's another story in, in, in the Ethiopian, uh, in the timeline of Ethiopian history. That's a footnote, right? It's rare to find, especially in, in African history, the failed coup d'etat as worthy of mention because 1960 we know 17, 18 African countries became independent, and that overshadows this very significant moment in Ethiopian history, right? The, the attempted coup. But so in writing this story, we have also have to be very attentive to uh, the short lifespan of the novel uh, in Ethiopian history in a country that has been writing for thousands of years, right? The secular um, uh, literature. Another archive I would consult. So there's wealth of material uh, in the new world, the way in which uh, black folk in this country and the Caribbean took the fascist uh, invasion as a, an attack on their own identity. So if one looks up pages of the crisis, if one looks up the pages of opportunity, these are Afro-American publications, if one takes up the pages of the New Amsterdam, right, there are stories at, at story after story after story of trying to mobilize uh, 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 black community, African American Caribbean community in this country uh, to uh, counter the fascist invasion, right? Uh, and you see this in these publications, but also in passing, um, I think of one of the great essays of the 20th century, James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. Even in passing, he says, um, 
he used to boycott the Italian grocers when he was young <laughs> as a way of identifying with the plight of uh, Ethiopians, right? As a way of showing his resistance to occupation, right? So I think that could be an archive where we also find uh, uh, an interesting story of the question of Ethiopia vis-a-vis -vis the fascist invasion. Now, related to that, what I would say is great distinction that was made for us, that this was not a colonial war, right? Uh, because when you think about it, the, the literary response in, 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 during decolonization uh, was dealing with questions that aren't really applicable to the Ethiopian fiction of the time. If we think of the Makarere school, uh, the Kenyan uh, writers, but also in Makarere as an institution, someone like Ngugi Wa Thiongo, or the West Coast in Chino Wachebe, the question of language, decolonizing the language, was not a question that was relevant to Ethiopian writers, right? So it's, I would say to um, add to this point of it wasn't a colonial war, it's not corroborated in that way in the literature in the wake of uh, the fascist invasion, right? They're not questioning how are we going to undo Italian colonialism in part because the short duration of the occupation, it didn't sink its, uh, its grip on the Ethiopian psyche in the way that demanded a, deco a decolonizing of the mind in other countries, right? Uh, so where do we find the Italian presence? For me, I would say in architecture. Now, we think of Asmara as the kind of the jewel, an art deco jewel, right? Uh, but even in Addis Ababa, uh, the, in a short amount of time, one, the Italian presence is palpable to me. We may not find it in the literature, but in the architecture. Architecture that was built during the occupation, but following the ar ar occupation, including the National Theater, City Hall, National Bank. These are, I mean, beautiful Art Deco buildings. So it might be interesting to think of these monuments or the memorials that were built uh, to commemorate the Patriots, right? These are living archives, right? Now, a, a, young, a generation that comes of age now may not know of their Italian uh, the Italian legacy imprint on the architecture, but we may think of these buildings as living archives. I think that's a place where it's in relief. The Italian presence is in relief, right? Uh, uh, now, so the, now to, it's not a seamless transition, but I'll end on this point about the imperative of literature. And why for me the literature that comes of age in the 1960s speaks to me because there's a kind of irreverence in it. And ultimately, and it cuts against, uh, you know, because pride is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's necessary to shore you up in the world, to give you a sense of identity, but it could also be a, a form of blind allegiance, where you abandon uh, a critical way of uh, interrogating the culture that produced you, right? And for me, it's that the, the writers who were writing in the 1960s who are proud of the Ethiopian identity, but at the same time, with the same breath, very critical. Uh, uh, so in that vein, I've uh, uh, finished a rough translation, uh, and I have to refine it, of a book that was published uh, in 1965-1966 by one of the great Ethiopian uh, uh, writers, uh, writers in, in the Amharic language, uh, and this is a book, a, a novella, um, uh, the Sabbath thing of the Seventh Angel. Now, the reason I picked it up is it has uh, explicit discussions of sexuality, specifically homosexuality. Uh, and it weds together the question of colonialism and homosexuality in the same, aligns them in a very interesting way. Now, if we think about the 60s, with the exception of maybe James Baldwin, it's rare to think of any writer, uh, even in the West, to broach these questions was a very a radical enterprise. And uh, Sivahat was doing it in 1966 uh, uh, in, in, in Amharic uh, uh, as an African novel, right? 
Uh, so, especially in this day and age where that question, the question of sexuality, has become a uh, contentious issue, and our politicians, our civic leaders, our religious leaders tell us that this is a foreign importation, here's a writer who's broaching the question before Western writers were tackling it. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, the imperative of literature, I think, is to be irreverent, it is to go against the grain. Uh, and one way we can uh, take up the legacy of our uh, predecessors is perhaps by way of translation and introducing them to uh, uh, a global audience. Uh, part of the, the, the dilemma of the Ethiopian writer is that because we still write in our own uh, uh, languages, that our writers have not courted the kind of uh, public attention that they deserve. And in fact, we heard from uh, uh, you know uh, an esteemed writer whose generation, Bogat was right. And I think the trans, the question of translation becomes all the more necessary, uh, so that you know when we think about African li literature, the the writers who, who gain attention are the ones who are trading in the lingua franca. So it's important to translate our writers writing now and also our writers of uh, previous generations. Thank you. Recognition 
at all. Um, I was finding through these Italians, through their letters. I have some photographs that I will show um, at the end, but I, I do think it's absolutely heartening and, and wonderful, all that, all that you've been saying, the stories of collaborators, I did not find in Ethiopia. Of course, my family did not talk about it, um, but I did find it through this, um, this other way of, of research. And I think, Dagmawi, you said something about, um, you know, the, the, the Italian occupation was, was five years. Um, they were there a total of six years. So there is the Italian presence through architecture, but I think that the, the more uh, long-lasting presence is also in family members who have Italian blood. I, you know, and I can't tell you how many times it's happened in my own family where my mother, actually this was a conversation we had just a few months ago, I was telling her, how do I find these stories? And she said, well, just ask Giovanni. <laughs> Who's Giovanni? And she said, your cousin. I said, which cousin? I have a lot of cousins. I said, which cousin? She said, Tesfai. I said, he and so two names. And there's an entire section of my family that has two different names. I, I didn't know this. So I think we can also talk about this the idea that, that history is present through blood. Um, and that's something that I hope we will, we will be able to open up the discussion. So somebody should stop me now. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we will open this up for, for questions. Any questions here? Oh, and there's a microphone that will go around. And please raise your hand very high. Gash uh, Gitaccio. Professor Gitaccio, uh, all the way in the back. Excuse me. Uh, this is about uh, colonial, whether Italian occupation was colonial or not. Uh, Ethiopians don't consider it colonial. The international community also wouldn't consider it colonial. Also, the Italian government doesn't consider it colonial because what Mussolini wanted was an empire. And he wanted another country with a king, with a kingdom under Italian uh, imperial uh, government, like the British Empire. That is what they wanted to establish. Uh, that's how the Italians also look at it. Uh, regarding the, um, uh, the resistance, uh, how long, this is my question, how long would it, have it lasted? Because the longer the Italians stayed, had there not been the Second World War, wouldn't the resistance uh, decline? Uh, in the course of time. <coughs> I just had a, um, this is just a comment. Uh, I, I have a book coming out. Can you hear me? It's not working. Yeah. It's on. Now, like this? Okay. So I have a book coming out on uh, fascist uh, empire cinema, and I chose to use the word empire cinema, which is never used for in Italian studies. They always say colonial cinema. But I wanted but the, the idea of empire and the proclamation of empire, and it, it, it was so such a large part of the propaganda and the mentality and the policies that uh, I, I went against tradition and made this, used this phrase very resolutely to mark off these years from 1935 really until uh, the, the, you know, the collapse in 41. So I think that's just to add on. This terminology is important. <coughs> I'll be uh, very brief. <coughs> Mm, the resistance, now we know, 
had international co co connections up to, up to a point. For instance, the Shoah and Patriots, particularly around Rasak of Aragon, there are contacts with uh, people in Djibouti and from Djibouti to the rest of the world. And also they followed radio, radio news. The Patriots of uh, Bagamde uh, had extensive contacts with the outside world uh, through the Sudan. So we know that they were connected with the rest of the world and they were following uh, the news. And so within this perspective, if uh, the British, uh, if the British had not, if Mussolini had not declared war on uh, the British, the British would not have come out against the Italians. And so uh, one would argue the patriotic movement would decline over time. Uh, I uh, am not so sure because these were uh, uh, move, uh, th this was a movement that was internationally connected and would continue the fight because of this uh, this connection. In addition to the internal uh, internal problems. Yes, you are right. In 1979, the pressure was very very intense on the patriots. They were uh, they were feeling the brunt of the Italian armed forces. Uh, if, if 1940 did not, uh, did not uh, turn the whole thing upside down because of Mussolini's declaration of war on Britain, uh, you would think that the situation would continue down. Uh, that is correct, but the international connection was there uh, as an important factor to keep uh, the movement going. That's what happened. <laughs> Thank you. Let me thank you for your presentation. Really interesting, especially for uh, for uh, an Italian scholar. And we need your uh, your kind of work in Italy. Uh, well, I would uh, touch uh, stress on one point. You touch uh, in your presentation, the first presentation from Andres. You spoke about the Italian-Ethiopian war as a part of the Second World War. And in a certain sense, uh, it could be true. What's happening in Ethiopia, in Spain, in China, uh, should prepare the Second World War. And most of all, uh, the legislative process of the humanization of the Ethiopian uh, citizen, the subject uh, pursued by Italian, uh, presents some point of contact with the uh, racist Italian legislation after the 1938. And it's also true that Ethiopia was a state recognized as a state and admitted in the society of nations. And in this sense, this, uh, the history of Ethiopia is quite different from uh, what's happened, uh, so called scramble for Africa at the end of the 19th century. But uh, for me, uh, this history um, is not only a, oh, this, this war, it's not only an inter sovereign state war, so it's remain a colonial war. And uh, well, because the Italian occupation project was a colonialistic project grounded on this uh, idea of civilization, and the Catholic Turkey supported this project according to this idea of civilization, and, but also because, well, uh, the dimension with this history is situated is a absolutely colonial. The Society of Nations was a colonial institution and uh, 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 that recognized the system of mandates and uh, uh, Germany and the United States uh, didn't subscribe the sanction. The sanction lasted just one year and after all the problem vanished and the imperial was proclaimed. So uh, what seems to me that uh, Denying or using the colonial dimension uh, leads to a normalization of this kind of history on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, we, lose, uh, we can lose a part of this history, that is the exceptionality uh, of the colonial dimension, the violence of these colonial dimensions. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, so two, 
That was that was excellent presentation. All of you, of you, all of you, really present the history and the reality, and uh, really what's happened on that East Africa as Italian colonization. You know, I'm so you know satisfied with your presentation and approach. And um, but my question is right here. Uh, I myself is a doctoral student at Columbia University, originally from Ethiopia, born. And uh, I'm just proud of the history that you present. And, but a question I have is, uh, earlier when you present your presentation, uh, I heard people even swear by their heroes, like Ras Ababa. And uh, they have, like, when we, uh, when we see Eastern Africa, Ethiopia, and even when it comes to the history of uh, George, I mean America, and you know George Washington, all those uh, present uh, rights, the Constitution, they are taken as a hero, as a father of the nation. And even though it was not included, you know the Negroes' history, you know that time when the rights institution uh, it was not written for a Negro, which means, which means it has its own little fault, but this father of the nation, taken as a father of the nation, as a father of the country, and still respected. Now my question is, when it comes to uh, present generation, present uh, Ethiopians, uh, how they take their fathers uh, like heroes in a current time? Even though, you know, like Westerns, like America, uh, they are taking this George Washington, all these leaders in father of the nation, even though when they start the nation, that was not something somewhat unfair issue is presented, but still at the same time, they are considered and taken as a father. And still we learn, you know, I, I, I educated in American school as well as as a, you know, Israel school system. And the history, what we learn in those countries, and they respect these fathers even though they have fought sometime. And now, when it comes to our history, uh, the current Ethiopians, uh, you know, I don't know what to teach for to my children and what to say, because uh, I, uh, I respect these fathers, heroes, which they made our name and gave us so, such a freedom. And what is now teaching the Ethiopian their children, and why they don't take their heroes. And you, uh, the historian, you said it was the heroism of the Minilik is declined in this. Why? Why we African, we are not proud of our fathers? Why we are like degrading our people? That's my question. I, I actually want to um, maybe touch on the America. Because, <laughs> if, because this is it, 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 history is it, it can't be just uh, it can't be an idol, you know what I mean? You have to have a critical relationship to history. So for a long time, for instance, in the American education system, at colleges, it's only recently that we have began to teach the history of slavery. That's only two, three decades old, right? It's only in the 1980s that this story came into the American Academy now finally making its way into high school education. So when you say George Washington, I'm interested in his slave. He was a slave owner. When he had a toothache, he pulled the tooth of one of his slaves and put it on his own. I'll think about that. Yeah. <laughs> right? So that's why when, when they are that's, respected. That's, when that's, exactly. they are done that way, they are respected as a father of the nation. But, but hear me out. Why we <coughs> can't. <coughs> yeah. So when I say, on the one hand, he held the found, one of the founding fathers, and I say, he was also a slave owner, right? That's why so, I'm comparing. Exactly. So we have to come up with a vocabulary to talk about, indeed, the achievements without masking the underside. You know what I mean? And I think that's the case in Ethiopian history, too, where, for instance, it's only recently where we talked about, call it slavery, use whatever name you want to use, in Ethiopia, in the expansion of them. Right? So, so some of our he heroes right, in the project of empire expansion may be implicated in that. So how do we come up, with, as you said, when we instill it in the younger generation, we, we can appreciate 
these cultural figures and icons without sanitizing them. You see what I mean? And I think that's a real, that's how we make history our own. That would be, uh, so I just wanted to mention the two. <laughs> <laughs> They know about it, that's why I, even when they do that, yeah. they are respected so how we sorry. can do it. I'm so sorry, I feel like we're just getting started. <laughs> um, but it is time for lunch. I see your hand okay. flashing, but please, please, can we uh, please save your questions for this next panel. I promise you that it will continue to build what we've been discussing, so you will get a chance to ask. And we'll see you here after lunch. What time do you think? Two thirty. Thank you.